Tune Review puts Speaking to the Blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the National Podcast, recorded at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Tune Review, that is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at tunereview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M or by calling 0141 772 3976. That's 0141 772 3976. This is from The National on Friday the 28th of April 2023 from the news section. Body found in Mugdock Reservoir amid Marel Sturrock murder probe. This article is written by Xander Elliards. Police searching a Scottish country park for a missing man after the death of a pregnant teacher have recovered a body from a reservoir. A man's body was recovered from the water in Mugdock Park, north of Glasgow, on Thursday. Officers said that while he is yet to be formally identified, it is believed to be David Yates, 36. Yates was the partner of Marelle Sturrock, 35, who was found dead at her home address in Jura Street in Glasgow on Tuesday the 25th of April. Marelle was 29 weeks pregnant at the time of her death, and her unborn child did not survive. Yates was wanted in connection with her murder and his car had been found at Mugdock Park. Police said the investigation remains ongoing, but nothing has been established so far to suggest anyone else was involved in her death. They further said that reports will be submitted to the Procurator Fiscal in due course. Detective Superintendent Nicola Kilbane said, Our thoughts are with Marelle's family and friends, along with everyone affected by this tragedy. We are providing her family with specialist support at this incredibly difficult time. The last confirmed sighting of Yates was on Sunday, just after 8pm. Police divers had been involved in the search and large areas of the reservoir were cordoned off with police tape, with officers standing guard. That article was written by Xander Elliards. This is from The National on Friday the 28th of April 2023 from the news section. From Zai Yusuf, I'll make sure Stone of Destiny comes back up the road. This article is written by Abby Garton Crosby. First Minister Humza Yusuf has insisted he will make sure the Stone of Destiny comes back up the road as the iconic relic heads to England for the first time in decades. Also known as the Stone of Schoon, the 125 kilogram slab of pinkish sandstone will be transported to London with high levels of security and details on its journey kept under wraps. It will be the first outing for the stone since it was officially returned to Scotland by Tory Prime Minister John Major in 1996. 700 years after it was stolen during the Wars of Independence. The Stone of Destiny will be placed beneath the coronation chair at Westminster Abbey ahead of King Charles' coronation on Saturday, May the 6th. Ahead of its journey, expected to be Thursday evening, First Minister Humza Yousaf was asked if he had seen off the Stone of Destiny to London yet. He told journalists in Holyrood, No, I think I'm going to the ceremony later today. Of course, I'll also be making sure it comes back up the road. As First Minister, Yusuf has been empowered under a royal warrant as Commissioner for the Keeping of the Regalia of the Safekeeping of the Stone and to be in charge of its arrangements to return to Westminster temporarily. While the Stone of Destiny may only be 67 centimetres in length, 24 centimetres in width, and almost 27 centimetres in height, it has played a massive role in centuries of royal tradition. It was last used in the coronation of Queen Elizabeth in 1953, 
shortly after four Scottish students seized the Stone of Destiny in a Christmas Day raid in 1950, bringing it back to Scotland and keeping it hidden for months until it was left on the altar of Arbroath Abbey and discovered in April 1951. The arrangements are being kept under wraps due to security concerns around the transportation due to the iconic nature of the stone. A Scottish Government spokesperson said there was no specific security threats and that the procedures were being kept secret as a precaution. We previously told how the Stone of Destiny will be moved from Edinburgh Castle in a bespoke transportation box to stop it from being damaged. Thought to be around 400 million years old, the stone will be escorted to London by the police and army before being placed in Westminster Abbey. Alba party leader Alex Salmond, previously called the First Minister, now Humza Yusuf, to refuse to allow the Stone of Destiny to be returned to England for the King's coronation. Alba also demanded that a hundred Scots guard the stone as it travels to prevent it from being stolen. Asked if this would be part of the level of security expected for the transportation, a Scottish Government spokesperson said, I don't think so. We previously told how Ian Hamilton, the last surviving member of the quartet who reclaimed the Stone of Destiny, sadly passed away aged 97 last year. Tributes flooded in for Hamilton, the lawyer who famously remained tight-lipped about his journey to Westminster Abbey. Hamilton was the last of the four to pass away, with fellow nationalists Gavin Vernon dying on March the 19th, 2004, teacher and political activist Kay Matheson on July the 6th, 2013, and Alan Stewart in June 2019. In 1996, towards the end of John Major's time in Number 10, he agreed it would be returned to Scotland. On July the 3rd that year, the Tory politician told the House of Commons, the Stone of Destiny holds a special place in the hearts of Scots. On this, the 700th anniversary of its removal from Scotland, it is appropriate to return it to its historic homeland. The centuries-old stone was returned on St Andrew's Day and was brought to Edinburgh, where it was put on display in Edinburgh Castle. It was initially taken to London by King Edward I of England in 1296. That article was written by Abby Garton Crosby. This is from The National on Friday the 28th of April 2023. From the news section. Port of Aberdeen sees £55 million investment in move towards net zero. This article is written by Lucy Garcia. The Port of Aberdeen is to invest £55 million into becoming the UK's first net zero port by 2040. Bosses at the port say they will work with both the public and private sector to reduce emissions in the port and facilitate future low carbon fuels. It is believed the introduction of shore power, electrical power provided to a ship while it is at birth, at scale, starting with the three births in 2024, will help to generate significant reductions in emissions in the years to come. The port has already rolled out electrical vehicles and LED lighting on its key sites as part of efforts to reduce the environmental impact of its operations. A wide range of projects are also underway or planned for the future, such as the trial of hydro-treated vegetable oil for port-owned vessels and equipment, and exploring the feasibility of on-site energy generation for the port estate. It comes after more than half a billion pounds was invested into the port's infrastructure in recent years, including the South Harbour expansion, which is set to provide more opportunity for growth in offshore wind, hydrogen and decommissioning. Bob Sanguinetti, Chief Executive at Port of Aberdeen said, Our vision is to become Scotland's premier net zero port, offering world-class facilities and services at the heart of the nation's energy transition. We must be bold and ambitious to achieve this. Today we launched our net zero strategy 
with the aim of becoming the UK's first net zero port by 2040. Strong partnerships and investment across the public and private sectors are essential to deliver this transformational change, which will deliver significant benefits for the environment, local communities and wider maritime sector. Port of Aberdeen can play a pivotal role in the emergence of green economic growth in the wider maritime industry and support new high quality jobs. Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero and Just Transition, Mari McCallan, said, I very much welcome Port of Aberdeen's Net Zero strategy and congratulate them on making this important investment in their future. The Scottish Government is committed to the decarbonisation of the transport sector in a sustainable way and the maritime sector has a vital role to play. An efficient and effective offshore energy sector is crucial for a robust economy and our work to decarbonise the maritime sector will take account of the critical importance of this sector in our supply infrastructure. I wish Port of Aberdeen every success as they aim for their ambitious target of reaching net zero by 2040. The Scottish Government has previously stated that it wishes to make Aberdeen the net zero capital of the world. That article was written by Lucy Garcia. This is from The National on Friday the 28th of April 2023 from the news section. Scotland Travel. Survey reveals the best seaside town. This article is written by Adam Robertson. A new survey has revealed the best seaside town in Scotland. Consumer champion, which surveyed over 3,000 visitors, asking them to rate their experiences of visiting seaside towns across the UK in the last year. Criteria included the quality of the beaches, food and drink offerings, tourist attractions and value for money. Where is Scotland's best seaside town? St Andrews in Fife was voted as the best seaside town in Scotland, coming joint fourth in the UK overall. It drew praise for its expansive beach and characterful buildings, as well as its renowned golf course. It received a five-star score for its tourist attractions. What other beaches in Scotland made the list? Also in the top ten was Tobermory on the Isle of Mull, which was ranked highly for its scenery. Piddenweem in Fife, which ranked highly for its seafront, scenery, peace and quiet and value for money, was also on the list. Stonehaven and Oban were further down the list with both receiving three stars in most of the categories they were ranked on. Largs in North Ayrshire also made an appearance, as did Dunbar East, which received a four-star rating for its food and drink. Where is the best seaside town in the UK? Topping the charts for the third consecutive year, Northumberland's Bamborough scored a score of 88% overall. Visitors awarded it a full five stars for scenery, as well as for the quality of the beach and seafront. Editor of Which, Travel, Rory Boland said, Few countries can be home to such a diversity of brilliant seaside breaks as Britain. That article was written by Adam Robertson. From the National, Friday 28th of April 2023 from the Culture section. Report details Church of Scotland's historical connections to slavery by Ross Hunter. The Church of Scotland is the custodian of a multi-million pound fund which can be traced back to compensation paid out to a family upon the abolition of slavery. A new report which details the organisation's connections to the transatlantic slave trade has been published and is set to be presented to the General Assembly next month. The research covers a 130-year period between the Act of Union in 1707, which led to the creation of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, and the abolition of slavery in Britain's colonies in the West Indies during the 1830s. 
It reveals that some Church of Scotland ministers and elders inherited wealth made on plantations from relatives in some buildings, including Glasgow Cathedral, have memorials to people who profited from the slave trade. Some church members also receive sums of money from plantation owners, while the organising the organisation itself is the custodian of a multi-million pound fund which can be connected to compensation paid out to a family of slave owners upon abolition. It is hoped the work will encourage the church to engage in self-reflection and to examine the roots of racial discrimination in Scotland. A survey of church members found that many felt the physical features of buildings that had links to historical slavery should not be removed, but instead to help the congregations and people in the local area learn about this chapter of Scotland's history. Up to 20,000 Scottish migrants arrived in the West Indies during the latter half of the 18th century, and it is likely that many places of worship were built by enslaved people such as St Andrew's Church in St George's, Grenada. The report recommends to the General Assembly that a statement of acknowledgement and apology should be brought forward in the future. It also calls for the creation of a dedicated page about the church's connection to the slave trade created for its website and recommends the creation of appropriate artwork to help congregations start conversations about the legacy of slavery. We have learned that the stories of slavery and abolition are often nuanced and not always clear cut, stated the report. For example, we note that one of the most visually recognisable proponents of abolition, Dr Robert Walker, the skating minister, who led the Presbytery of Edinburgh to petition Parliament in 1788, was also named eight years previous in 1780 as the residuary heir of the estate of his brother John Walker, a merchant operating in St Lucia. We are also mindful of the number of sons of mans who profited, some significantly, from the enslavement of their fellow humans, while also recognising the commendable campaigns of many presbyteries and synods as part of the abolition movement. It added, We have learned that there is architectural evidence of connection to slavery within some of our church buildings, although it is not believed to be as widespread as first thought. There are some examples where the church or ministers can be seen to have benefited directly from the profits of slavery. What we do see are many instances where money was left to ministers and Kirk sessions to distribute among the parish or to be used as philanthropic causes. The report said some Scots who made financial social gains from enslavement left a portion of their money or philanthropic purposes such as caring for the poor. This raises important questions regarding the origins of money from which many people in Scotland, including the church, benefited, it stated. If the church is committed to seeking racial justice, then we must seek to acknowledge the origins of such funds that the church either received for its own use or distributed for others. This article was by Ross Hunter. From the National, Monday the 1st of May 2023, from the news section, Police Scotland, £100,000 worth of drugs recovered in Glasgow. Report by James Walker. Two men, aged 43 and 27, have been arrested and charged in connection with drugs offences after a warrant was carried out in Glasgow. They are due to appear at Glasgow Sheriff Court on Monday, 1st of May 2023. Officers attended a property in the Gove Hill Drive area on Friday, 20th of April 2023. Cannabis was recovered, with an estimated street value of £100,000, and a five-figure sum of cash was also recovered. Detective Inspector Stephen McBride said, This was a significant drugs recovery that has taken £100,000 worth of drugs off the streets in Scotland. Serious and organised crime brings misery to those living in our local communities, and I want to reassure the public that we will continue to use every resource and tactic at their disposal to disrupt this kind of activity, and stop these illegal substances reaching our streets. We rely on the support of the public, so if you have any information or concerns about drugs in your community, please contact us through 101. Alternatively, Crime Stoppers can be contacted on 0800 555511, that's 0800 555 where anonymity can be maintained. And that report was by James Walker. From the National, Monday the 1st of May 2023, 
from the politics section, with throwing new rules on Scotland's overseas work, UK government told. Report by Gregor Young. The UK government has been told to withdraw its new rule aimed at curtailing Scottish ministers' overseas work. It emerged last month that Foreign Secretary James Cleverly had issued a letter to all UK diplomats with four demands in handling Holyrood ministers' foreign visits and discussions. The rules were as follows. All ambassadors must gather information on news of Scottish ministers' foreign trips. All Scottish government communication with foreign countries must go through the UK. All ambassadors must tell foreign countries to go through the UK and not talk directly to Scottish representatives. And, finally, a UK official must sit in in a meeting with Holyrood officials and foreign counterparts. The letter was condemned by experts including Dr Kirsty Hughes, a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, who previously worked at the European Commission, who said that foreign diplomats would clearly see that the Scottish Government ministers were being treated like children. Now, External Affairs Secretary Angus Robertson has written to Cleverly, calling on him to withdraw the guidance, warning he is concerned that the damage it could cause Scottish trade, cultural exchanges and education, and to Scottish interests in general. Robertson said he first became aware of the guidance from a newspaper journalist rather than a UK government figure. He expressed concerns over a number of omissions and misleading assertions, telling cleverly that the guidance would be unworkable. The minister argued that as an ancient nation, Scotland has a long history of international engagement, but said seeking to curtail that work is a further example of Tory plans to roll back on devolution. The UK government's apparent determination to reduce Scotland to the status of a mere administrative unit and for it to be characterised as such by the UK government diplomats is unacceptable, Robertson told cleverly. Elsewhere in the letter, Robertson questions UK ministers' fears that the Scottish government could be encroaching on reserved issues during international meetings. He pointed out that international relations being reserved does not have a legal effect of stopping Scottish ministers from communicating with foreign officials or bodies, as long as they do not purport to speak for the UK or to reach agreements which commit to the UK. It should be needless to say that the Scottish Government ministers would never purport to speak for the UK, Robertson said. The fact that we have very different views in such matters, such as immigration, asylum and Brexit, will be well known to governments overseas, and it would be absurd to think that such our such views could be confused with those of the UK government. Robertson concluded the letter by accusing the UK government of an attempt to censor Scottish ministers. The letter and guidance give an an accurate picture of both the way the Union itself is supposed to operate and of devolution, and, above all, they will damage the Scottish economy and the range of Scottish interests, he wrote. It is for these reasons that I ask you to withdraw both the guidance and your letter. A a foreign Commonwealth and Development Office spokesperson said, The UK has one of the best, most expansive and expert diplomatic services in the world, with people from across the UK representing our interests abroad. As a permanent member of the UN Security Council, the G7, NATO and the Commonwealth, the UK has an unparalleled influence on the international stage. We are delivering effectively for the whole of the UK, including by ensuring that Scotland's interests remain at the heart of our international agenda. Commenting on his letter, Robertson described ministerial work abroad as a key driver of opportunities in areas like foreign investment. It came just days after Japanese firm Osaka announced it would be building a large electrical cable manufacturing plant in the Highlands, as Wellbeing Economist Secretary Neil Gray paid a visit to the country. Outside of London, Scotland leads the UK in attracting inward investment, with foreign direct investment in the country increasing by 14% since 2020, compared to just 1.8% across the UK as a whole. We will, of course, resist any any move by the UK government to curtail these types of visits and reduce opportunities to promote Scottish trade and investment opportunities, said Robertson. And that was an opinion piece by Gregor Young. The National News on Wednesday the 3rd of May. Chris Packham's libel battle with publishers begins. An article written by James Walker. 
Chris Packham has had an enormous amount of puerile, offensive and damaging material published about him, the High Court has heard at the start of his libel claim on Tuesday. The television naturalist, who's 61, is suing three men over nine articles which claimed he defrauded people into donating to a charity to rescue tigers while knowing the animals were well looked after, described in court as tiger fraud. Dominic Whiteman, editor of the online site Country Squire magazine, is defending the libel claim along with writer Nigel Bean and a third man, Paul Reed. The strongly denied allegations, repeated in several tweets and videos, relate to Mr Packham's involvement in the Wild Heart Trust, which runs a wildlife sanctuary on the Isle of Wight. At the start of the trial on Tuesday, the High Court in London heard that the environmentalist was accused of abusing his privileged position as a BBC presenter to dishonestly appeal for donations for the charity, of which he and his partner, Charlotte Corney, are trustees. Jonathan Price, acting for the presenter, said, It's now a facility that rescues animals in need of a forever home, as they put it, because for whatever reason they are unwanted by their former owners. It's a central allegation in this case that it is fraudulent to attach the word rescue to this process. The environmentalist, who is expected to give evidence on Wednesday, was accused of misleading the public into donating by claiming tigers had been rescued from a circus, while he allegedly knew they had been well treated and were instead donated. Mr Price said in written submissions, Mr Packham is well known for his decades of vociferous campaigning for and strongly held beliefs on animal welfare and nature conservation issues. An argument that he does not genuinely hold those beliefs but has instead sought to defraud the public for money is, at best, an ambitious one. The court was told that Mr Packham had been described by the defendants as a fraud, a notorious liar of having an obvious nastiness and of playing the Asperger's victim card. Mr Price argued that the three men intended to run a full frontal attack on Mr Packham's character during the legal case and to get him fired. As the litigation has progressed, the defendants have published an enormous amount of puerile, offensive and damaging material about the claimant, often under the guise of fundraising for their defence, the barrister said in written submissions. Nicholas O'Brien, acting for Mr Whiteman and Mr Bean, said the articles in the claim were true and could also be defended as under the public interest. In written submissions, the barrister said, It's clear that the tigers had not been rescued from a circus, were not then in need of rescue, and were not rescued by Mr Packham. Mr O'Brien said the pair contend that Mr Packham knew the statements were false and that they were therefore made dishonestly. They were also fraudulent in that they were made with a view to a gain and constituted an abuse of his privileged position as a BBC presenter, he added. David Price, KC, acting for retired computer programmer Mr Reed, said he was not responsible for the publications attributed to him as he was a mere proofreader. In written submissions, he continued, Mr Reed's proofread version was then subject to further amendment by Mr Whiteman and or Mr Bean before publication. Mr Price added that Mr Whiteman had admitted responsibility. The fact that Mr Reed was given courtesy byline credits cannot override the hard evidence as to his limited involvement, he added. The trial before Justice Saini is due to conclude on May the 12th, with a decision expected at a later date. An article written by James Walker. The National News on Wednesday the 3rd of May. Cancellation of Cherry event is unlawful, former Tory MP says. An article written by Adam Robertson. A former Tory MSP has said an Edinburgh comedy club has acted unlawfully after calling off an event with SNP MP Joanna Cherry. The stand has already released a statement claiming staff were not comfortable working at an event which would have been part of a series of discussions with various high-profile Scots. Professor Adam Tompkins, a law professor at Glasgow University and former Tory MSP for the Glasgow region, told the BBC's Good Morning Scotland programme it was straightforwardly unlawful that Ms Cherry's event had been cancelled because of staff concerns. 
describing it as an uncomplicated case of direct discrimination. He said, if you make a decision which is made on the basis that you disagree with somebody's philosophical beliefs, it's as if you're discriminating against them on the basis of their religion. There's no distinction in the law between religious discrimination and discrimination on the basis of philosophical belief. He added that being gender critical would be recognised as forming part of Ms Cherry's philosophical beliefs in the eyes of the law. He said, it looks as if the stand has made a decision to cancel Joanna Cherry's event on the basis of a disagreement with her philosophical belief. That's a protected characteristic under the Equality Act, and therefore it's direct discrimination and unlawful. The stand said it had become clear that a number of its staff were unwilling to work on this event and that it would not compel them to work the event. As a result, the venue said it was unable to properly staff the talk and that it had advised the show's producers, Fair Play Productions, that Ms Cherry could no longer speak at the event. Asked if the stand is in a difficult position by having to work with staff members that don't want to participate, Professor Tompkins replied, No, I don't think they are. Isn't it akin to this situation? What if I were a nurse and I was a Jehovah's Witness and I was religiously opposed to blood transfusions and I said to the NHS I was unprepared to work on wards in which there were going to be blood transfusions? What if I was a Catholic doctor that refused to undertake certain medical procedures because they were a violation of my beliefs? This is unprofessional conduct. It wouldn't be permitted in the NHS. We don't permit religious discrimination in this country anymore and we shouldn't be permitting discrimination on the basis of disagreement with people's philosophical beliefs. He said that everybody has the right to speak back and that the answer to disagreeing with people is not to silence but to listen. He added that he does not agree with all sorts of Ms Cherry's views but that he would rather listen to, engage with and challenge her arguments. Ms Cherry tweeted in response, Thanks, Professor Tompkins, for your support, not for my views but for my right to express them and for confirming that the Stand Comedy Club cancellation of me is unlawful direct discrimination based on my philosophical beliefs. An article written by Adam Robertson The National Politics on Wednesday the 3rd of May Fergus Ewing tears up HPMA paper during debate an article written by Hamish Morrison and Abby Garton Crosby. Fergus Ewing MSP ripped up a copy of the Scottish Government's Highly Protected Marine Area, or HPMA, consultation document during a members' debate in Holyrood yesterday. The former SNP Rural Affairs Minister said he'd never seen such a backlash to a policy in almost half a century, warning that it would haunt the government. He called for the consultation to be withdrawn and the minister responsible to apologise. Concerns have been raised in recent weeks over the impact highly protected marine areas could have on rural areas. The proposals would see strict limits on human activity, from fishing to swimming, in at least a tenth of Scotland's coastal waters. During a debate on the issue brought by Lib Dem MSP Beatrice Wishart, Mr Ewing said... The only mention of fishermen says that what they do is destructive. What an incredible act of provocation that is. He added, This will haunt the Scottish Government. This issue, this will not go away. This is not a consultation document. It's a notice of execution. He suggested the idea should be placed in the Burgeoning Policy Recycling Unit, along with a deposit return scheme and consultation on alcohol advertising. He then tore up the document. Meanwhile, former Finance Secretary and SNP leadership contender Kate Forbes used her first speech in Holyrood from the backbenches since 2018 to deliver a stark warning on the HPMA plans. The rarest species in our coastal areas and our islands will soon become people if these proposals go ahead as planned, she said. Ms Forbes, who also raised concerns about the knock-on impact a demise of fishing could have on the culture and heritage of island communities, added, My position in the leadership contest was that I would scrap HPMAs completely if elected. I didn't win. 
and my job now is to represent my constituents and to navigate a way forward. Ms Forbes credited Net Zero Secretary Mary McAllen for her engagement with rural communities, but said her and First Minister Hamza Youssef's assertion that HPMAs would not be imposed in communities where they were not wanted may result in such areas being hard to establish because she's not heard from anyone who is in favour. She used the final minute of her speech to quote from a protest song about HPMAs from the band Skippinish, which likened the proposals to the Highland Clearances. Speaking to the BBC's Good Morning Scotland earlier, Ms Forbes said the Scottish Government had turned a corner in its approach and that she believed it was now listening to the concerns of communities. Closing the debate, Ms McCallan, who yesterday met with coastal MSPs about the issue, said the proposals were at an early stage, assuring the Chamber that she will gather as much information as I possibly can on the views of how this should be taken forward. She added, We all recognise the importance of Scotland's coastal and island communities and the industries that support them. We recognise the importance, the indispensable value of working with them as we develop the policy. But at the same time, we must all recognise the threat that our environment is under. The debate came at the same time as organisations representing the fishing industry said they were united in being strongly opposed to the plans. HPMAs have united the fishing sector, salmon farmers and a whole host of other businesses in opposition to the proposals, which would ban any sort of human activity. A joint statement from the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, Seafood Scotland, Salmon Scotland, the Scottish Association of Fish Producers Organisation and the Community Fisheries Inshore Alliance said... Inside and outside Parliament, there is widespread cross-party and community opposition to proposed HPMAs. This echoes the sector's fears that designating at least 10% of Scotland's seas as HPMAs will have far-reaching consequences for Scotland's coastal communities and economies. The group called on the Scottish Government to either drop or rethink the proposals and engage with the sector. Meanwhile, Highland Council, the local authority with the longest coastline in Scotland, has voiced strong opposition to the HPMA proposals. The SNP Independent Administration has joined local authorities in Argyll and Butte, Shetland, Orkney and the Western Isles in voicing opposition to the proposals, saying it has concerns over potential significant socio-economic impacts. An article written by Hamish Morrison and Abby Garten Crosby. The National News on Wednesday, the 3rd of May. First cruise ship docks after £400 million expansion. An article written by Jane McLeod. The port of Aberdeen yesterday welcomed the first cruise ship into its £400 million South Harbour expansion. The 202-metre-long Ada Ora, with capacity for more than 1,200 guests, is the longest vessel to visit the port of Aberdeen to date. The vessel arrived from Hamburg in Germany for a full-day visit as part of a Scottish cruise. The Ada Ora berthed on Castlegate Quay and the guests were greeted by a 50-strong pipe band and Highland dancers from Robert Gordon's College and volunteers from Visit Aberdeenshire. Port of Aberdeen Chief Executive Bob Sanguinetti said, While the tourism industry is still recovering from the impact of the pandemic, we're very encouraged with a number of calls to the port secured for this year and next. The Port of Aberdeen is a gateway to the amazing attractions of North East Scotland. We look forward to growing our work with the international cruise industry in the coming years. Alongside the Eda Ora and the arrival of the Polar Exhibition ship NG Resolution to Aberdeen's North Harbour, the port will welcome 39 cruise ships from May to October. With up to 31,000 guests visiting the region, the port expects to boost the local economy by up to £4.2 million. The port of Aberdeen harbourmaster Alex McIntosh said... The arrival of two very different ships into the port of Aberdeen on a single morning demonstrates how our expertise, capabilities and infrastructure can support a wide range of cruise lines. 
The expansion of the port is also expected to catalyse growth in cruise tourism, with more than 50 calls already booked for 2024. Visit Aberdeenshire Chief Executive Chris Foy added, The arrival of the first cruise ship into the South Harbour marks a step change for tourism in the North East, as we welcome larger vessels and more passengers than ever before. An article written by Jane McLeod. The National Politics on Wednesday the 3rd of May. First Minister says nothing is off the table at a big poverty summit. An article written by Abby Garten Crosby. First Minister Hamza Youssef has said nothing is off the table ahead of an anti-poverty summit. The SNP leader will say that tackling poverty and inequality is the biggest challenge facing Scotland at the meeting with stakeholders in Edinburgh today. Mr Youssef is said to lead the summit where Scottish Government ministers will meet with and listen to key partners, campaigners, cross-party representatives and those with direct experience of poverty. It comes as the SNP called on the UK Government to match the ambition of the Scottish Child Payment and raise the child element of universal credit by £25 a week. The Scottish Payment has been hailed as a game-changer for low-income families. Opening the anti-poverty summit, the First Minister is expected to say the Scottish Government recognises that the cost of living crisis is putting a huge strain on households and no one should have to make the choice between heating, eating or turning the lights on. Tackling poverty and inequality is the single biggest challenge facing Scotland and requires continued, urgent and sustained action. Today's anti-poverty summit is an opportunity to get round the table with campaigners, businesses, the third sector, local government, representatives from Holyrood's main political parties and, crucially, those with direct experience of poverty to hear their views and insights. This is the collaborative approach that people across Scotland want to see their First Minister and political leaders take to secure real action on the biggest issues facing our country. In one of his first moves after being elected First Minister, Mr Youssef tripled the Fuel Insecurity Fund by adding £30 million to the scheme to help Scots in need. It came after a previous announcement from former Deputy First Minister John Swinney that £20 million set aside for an independence referendum would be used to boost funding from £10 million, with the new incumbent increasing the pot. The First Minister is expected to add... We have a strong foundation to build on, with almost £3 billion allocated this year to support policies which tackle poverty and protect people as far as possible during the cost of living crisis. And we've announced details this week of how tens of thousands of households will be supported as a result of the fuel insecurity fund being tripled. But as we discuss what more can be done... Nothing will be off the table and I look forward to hearing all contributions at the summit, which I hope will drive new momentum in the fight against poverty in Scotland. Energy Minister Gillian Martin announced yesterday how the Fuel Insecurity Fund would be allocated, including providing £9 million for Home Heating Support Fund grants to offer immediate relief for families in Scotland struggling with rising prices. The cash is set to be administered by Advice Direct Scotland. A further £8.5 million will be given to the Fuel Bank Foundation, which helps about 85,000 households struggling with fuel insecurity. Meanwhile, £7.25 million will be given to the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, with a target of providing more than 55,000 households with support, advice and energy-saving items. And social enterprise group The Wise Group will also be provided with £5 million to offer one-to-one mentoring to households. Speaking during a visit to Advice Direct Scotland's headquarters in Glasgow, Ms Martin said, The Fuel Insecurity Fund has been and continues to be a direct lifeline for many thousands of households, which is why the First Minister acted swiftly and decisively to triple the fund to £30 million this year. We want to support even more people facing unprecedented rises in the cost of energy. 
While the key energy policy levers remain with the UK government, one of our interdependent missions as a government is to tackle poverty and protect people from the impact of the current cost of living crisis, which is why we've taken this action. She added, the UK government has continually failed to take the necessary steps to support people now and make the necessary changes, which only it can take, to ensure households and businesses never experience an energy crisis like this again. This includes reversing its decision to end the Energy Bill Support Scheme and making essential reforms to the energy market so the link between the price of electricity and the cost of gas is permanently broken. Advice Direct Scotland's Director of Business Development and Policy, Connor Forbes, said the organisation was delighted to be working with the Scottish Government on the new funding. He further stressed the importance of those struggling with fuel costs reaching out for support. Wise Group Chief Executive Officer Sean Duffy said it was great to see the Government taking action on poverty. He said it proved the government was pledging to take a personalised approach to support each household in a way that supports sustainable change. We previously told how SNP Westminster group leader Stephen Flynn warned that UK government policies are making people poorer and undermining progress on tackling poverty in Scotland. He urged the UK government to introduce a wide range of measures to reverse child poverty – from scrapping the benefit cap to introducing a real living wage. An article written by Abby Garten Crosby. The National Politics on Wednesday, the 3rd of May. Labour leader poised to scrap pledge for free university tuition fees. An article written by Adam Robertson. Sakir Starmer is set to scrap his party's commitment to free university tuition according to a report from The Times. Labour's previous two general election manifestos have promised to abolish tuition fees in England. During Mr Starmer's leadership campaign in 2020, he pledged to retain the policy, but this is now to be reversed, The Times reported. A senior party source told the newspaper, at a time when we're being so careful about spending commitments, it's a glaring anomaly that we still haven't moved on tuition fees. It's one of the remaining commitments from 2019 that we'll be clear we've moved on from. Speaking to the BBC Radio 4's Today programme, Mr Starmer appeared to confirm the report. He said, We're likely to move on from that commitment because we do find ourselves in a different financial situation. We're looking at options for how to fund these fees. The current system is unfair, it doesn't really work for students and it doesn't work for universities. He added that the party would set out a fairer solution in the coming weeks and that he did not want the U-turn to be read as us accepting for a moment that the current system is fair or that it is working. Mr Starmer previously insisted the pledges which formed his leadership bid haven't all been abandoned. However, in January, he told The Times, University tuition fees are not working well. Obviously, we've got a number of propositions in relation to those fees that we will put forward as we go into the election. But the damage that has been done to our economy means that we're going to have to cost everything as we go into that election. Many took to social media to criticise the Labour leader. SNP policy development convener Tony Giuliano told The National, another flagship Labour policy in the bin. Starmer and Sunak should consider a merger. Labour are moving so far to the right that they're indistinguishable from the Tories. But there's also a question of integrity for Starmer, who's flip-flopping on every issue under the sun. An article written by Adam Robertson. The National Politics on Wednesday the 3rd of May. Bonnie Blue Flag Day, Saltire's Call for Coronation. A front-page article written by Laura Pollock and Hamish Morrison. Yes, activists are encouraging Scott to fly the saltire flag on Saturday in response to the Coronation Day celebrations. The National Saltire Day on Saturday, or Bonnie Blue Flag Day as organisers are calling it, is to signal unity of the Yes movement and provide international media with images of saltires contrasting against Union Jack flags. 
David Macy Lilly, an activist since the 1960s, and James Scott, founder of The Scottish Resistance, have been getting in touch with yes groups across the country in hope of their idea picking up traction. Mr Macy Lilly had the idea while watching an Independence Live live stream show one evening which discussed what Scots could do and bring the different factions of Yes together. He said, I thought that with all these street parties on with Union Jack flags everywhere, what could we do? We could stick a saltire on our window. It means we know we're doing something for Scotland and the movement and not something for the Yoon Fest. It's literally that, the simplest thing ever. The idea has grown wings, he said, with interest from several groups, including Wales for Scottish independence. But more are welcome, as the more that know, the better. Mr Macy Lilly said that in the borders, the idea of a street party this weekend is something to give yeses at home a way to signal their support and unity of Scots without going to the rallies in Glasgow and Edinburgh. The retired engraver said he hoped to see some saltires flying on Saturday. He added, Imagine what it would look like, a sea in the streets, with every second window having a saltire in it. It would fill you with pride. This comes as former First Minister Alex Salmond confirmed he will attend a pro-independence rally rather than attending the coronation, as he fired a broadside at Hamza Youssef for going The Alba party leader said he would attend an all-under-one-banner rally in Glasgow on May the 6th, as he accused the current First Minister of acting like a pet poodle when the Stone of Destiny was transferred to London ahead of the ceremony. Speaking after an interview with LBC's Andrew Marr, Mr Salmon said that any self-respecting nationalist First Minister should be with the masses in Glasgow, not the classes in London as he confirmed he would attend the Yes rally in Scotland's biggest city this weekend. Some within the SNP feel his stance is hypocritical, pointing to his comments following the 2011 royal wedding, when he said he should have had Edinburgh covered in royal standards. Mr Salmond, who is a member of the King's Privy Council, said he would have put a ring of policemen around Edinburgh Castle, were he still First Minister, to prevent the Stone of Destiny from being taken south of the border. He said, you don't command very much as First Minister, but you do command the Scottish police force. You could have put a ring of policemen around Edinburgh Castle. Have a standoff on the Esplanade and politely explain to the world that Scotland should not sacrifice its symbol of sovereignty until that sovereignty is at least recognised by Westminster and the powers that are. A front page article written by Laura Pollock and Hamish Morrison. The National News on Wednesday the 3rd of May. New coast-to-coast cycling route unveiled. An article written by James Walker. A new 250-mile on-road cycle route crossing the whole of the south of Scotland will be officially launched this summer. The coast-to-coast route, named the Kirkpatrick C2C, will run from Stranra to Eyemouth, making it one of the longest in the UK and a new challenge for experienced cyclists. The route is named after Kirkpatrick Macmillan, a 19th century Dumfrieshire blacksmith who invented the first pedal-driven velocipede, the precursor to today's bicycle. Experienced riders have been urged to complete the route in four or eight days, journeying along dramatic coastlines and among rolling hills, shimmering lochs and historic mills. Early projections suggest the new route could attract up to 175,000 new visitors to the region, with a direct spend of £13.7 million per year. Businesses are already gearing up for the extra tourism. David Hope Jones is the chief executive of the South of Scotland Destination Alliance, who helped set up the route. He said, in a terrific year for cycling in the South of Scotland, home of the bike, Excitement is really building now right along the route of the Kirkpatrick C2C, one of the longest and most exciting on-road routes in the UK. We're working closely with businesses right along the route to help them harness the benefits of cycle tourism, which is growing all the time and set to be a major part of Scotland's visitor economy. Visit Scotland's Destination Development Director Gordon Smith said... 
the Kirkpatrick C2C is a fantastic addition to the region's already strong cycling offer. The opening of this route comes at an exciting time for cycling in Scotland, as we count down to hosting the biggest cycling event in the world, the 2023 UCI Cycling World Championships, including events in the Scottish Borders and Dumfries and Galloway. With new cycling initiatives and experiences being created right across the country, such as the Kirkpatrick C2C, promoting cycling and helping businesses cater for this growing market will benefit communities right across the region and beyond. An article written by James Walker. The National, on Wednesday the 3rd of May. Opinion. I'm spooked by artificial intelligence but I can see the benefits that it can bring. A column written by Asa Samake Roman. At first, a few months ago, we played with generative artificial intelligence, interviewed it and asked silly questions, and thought, isn't it crazy what technology can do? We were in awe of its capabilities and found it highly entertaining. Then we witnessed its power in action as chat GPT passed law, business and medicine exams and wrote essays and articles in an English much better than I could ever speak. We wondered, is this thing going to make us all jobless? Later, we were fooled by AI-generated images and some of us fell victim to the illusion of reality. I was left stunned by an image of Pope Francis wearing a long white puffer jacket, which turned out to be a product of AI fabrication. Now the question arises, is it soon going to be impossible to distinguish truth from AI generation, with serious implications for the journalism industry and democracy in general? I write as someone who has grown to be enthusiastic about AI, a revolution that experts compare to the invention of the personal computer and the smartphone. I can see the potential benefits it can bring in terms of efficiency, productivity and relieving us from repetitive and menial tasks, allowing us to focus on more creative, groundbreaking and altogether more exciting pursuits. Think, for example, of how it could contribute to better medical care, with AI helping with earlier diagnosis, leading to better outcomes for patients. But still, these technologies make my head spin. Scientists are making major exponential advances, and I'm not sure we, the general public and politicians alike, have a good grasp of the sophisticated tool that is now in all our hands. It's apparent, too, that AI is not only a question for the scientists, engineers and all those who are technically inclined. What defines intelligence, learning and creation? Can all-powerful algorithms really replace everything we do? These are the questions AI forces us to confront, like a mirror for our species. And this is why we need humanities. While people often joke that they are useless because a philosopher is not going to send a rocket into space, in this dizzyingly rapid evolution of technology, artists, philosophers, historians and ethics experts are essential voices to help us make sense of the tool we've created and to educate ourselves on its limitations as well as its potential. Of course, many applications of AI have already found their way into our daily lives without us even noticing. Search engines use machine learning algorithms and natural language processing systems. Social networks use similar algorithms to show you content specifically relevant to you. Voice assistants use AI to understand what you say and provide a relevant answer. But now, more than ever, we're freaked out, particularly following the blunt warnings from leading experts and pioneers in the field. The latest one, Geoffrey Hinton, stated in the New York Times that he no longer believes the prospect of artificial brains outsmarting human brains is a distant one. We're in full uncanny valley. When a machine achieves a certain degree of anthropomorphic resemblance, we find it disturbing. All of a sudden, we feel like we live in a science fiction story where the machines look, sound and act increasingly like humans. This creates a fear that the next step in this evolution will be the loss of control over our creations, rendering us obsolete as human beings. 
This is making me think of Real Humans, a Swedish sci-fi television show I avidly watched a decade ago, where androids called Hubots are used as warehouse workers, house servants and even sex workers. While the majority embraces their presence, a group seeks to dismantle and eradicate them, blaming them for stealing human jobs. Whereas Hubots are just supposed to obey and work, some have been illegally hacked and seem to develop free will, empathy and even faith. The show ends up raising questions such as, are humans and super-evolved robots essentially the same? Should Hubots have equal rights? Real Humans showed us a not-too-distant future that spooked viewers. Fast forward 10 years, with the rapid evolution of AI technology which is now entering the mainstream, we're pondering similar questions. It challenges us to think about the consequences of what we create and to not wait for something tragic to happen to regulate it. We made this mistake with social media, entrusting it to the general public before sufficiently assessing what it would mean for our privacy, our politics and the very fabric of our society. The future of work is also a very important question in the context of AI. It's easy to be freaked out at the prospect of AI destroying jobs. We can see how some office jobs could be completed by machine. But many require a high level of originality, interpersonal skills and decision-making abilities that AI-based systems are incapable of. Although AI systems are capable of analysing vast amounts of data, they remain unable to understand what they do. Artificial intelligence may generate gigantic volumes of content, but it's always going to consist of imitation and good execution. An AI can imitate Van Gogh or Velasquez, but it can't imagine what artists are going to do in the 22nd century, because it doesn't exist yet. Only the power of the human mind can bring it into reality. A very interesting discussion, I find, is about how much more wealth could be created and how it could be redistributed. Interestingly, this debate is not happening much. William Spriggs, an economics professor at Howard University and chief economist at the American Federation of Labour and Congress of Industrial Organisations, the largest federation of unions in the United States, has an idea as to why. Companies don't want to have a discussion about sharing the benefits of these technologies, he said. They'd rather have a discussion to scare the bejesus out of you about these new technologies. They want you to concede that you're just grateful to have a job and that you'll pay us peanuts. One way or the other, we're going to have to learn to live and work with AI. It is here and it's here to stay. An AI probably won't replace me as a journalist, but a journalist with a good understanding and use of AI might. Digital illiteracy is my enemy right now. It's high time to catch up and get in sync with the times. A column written by Asa Samaki Roman. The National, on Wednesday the 3rd of May. Opinion. Why I declared independence dead for a generation. A column written by Professor Tom Devine. My recent interview with BBC's Scotland editor, and in particular my views on the future for Scottish independence, have elicited a robust number of comments from readers of The National. I am grateful to your editor for allowing me some space to respond to them in general terms, and also to clarify my own position, which is not always possible in a brief television interview. I begin by stating that I am not, and never have been, a member of the SNP. I repeat also my well-rehearsed position over numerous interviews in the past that I am a historian. The future is not my period. When asked about the future of Scottish independence by the BBC reporter, I responded as a citizen of Scotland who voted for independence in 2014 and gave my opinion with no more or less authority behind it based on my evaluation of recent events concerning the SNP and the Scottish Government. Of course, equally, it would be naive for me not to accept that my prognosis was in part formed by more than 50 years of study, research and reflection on the history of Scotland in comparative international contexts. 
Others can judge whether that gives me any more authority than anyone else to consider meaningfully what might happen in future years to our nation. Personally, I doubt it does, since, as one of the Nationals' correspondents pointed out, events, dear boy, events, have and will continue to fatally undermine even the best informed predictions of what is likely to happen even in the next few decades or so. The point I was making to the BBC was not intended to suggest that the current opinion figures for independence of around 45% of Scottish voters would necessarily collapse soon. Rather, I was arguing that there is no chance whatsoever of a UK government of whatever political stripe granting a referendum on independence unless there is at least a sustained polling majority of more than 60% in favour of that outcome in Scotland. Achieving that threshold has proven impossible even during the recent years of very unpopular UK Conservative rule and is likely to be even more problematic if, as seems likely at present, the Labour Party wins the next general election. A proportion, at least, of Scottish voters who would vote for independence may well be driven mainly by a passionate desire to be rid of Tory hegemony once and for all. The Conservatives last won a majority of Scottish seats in a general election nearly eight decades ago, and since then the country has remained moderately left-wing in political culture under both Labour and the SNP. The threshold mentioned above can only be reached by winning over many more Scottish voters to the cause of independence. I'm of the view that the chances of that happening any time soon are simply not within the realms of possibility. There's been a slow burn, but nevertheless a visible and steady alienation from non-SNP voters over Scottish Government policies on a long list of issues, from ferries to healthcare and from the economy to education. No devolved government can win support for more radical constitutional change other than by demonstrating competence in devolved administration. This has not happened over the last decade or more. Attracting support from soft unionists to reach credible numbers to force a referendum is presently therefore nothing other than pie in the sky. Recent media exposures of financial irregularities within the SNP may not result in criminal charges. Even so, perceptions of corruption, or to use the modern term, optics, are bound to linger. SNP members in their wisdom elected a continuity candidate in the leadership elections who had low poll popularity ratings among the Scottish public. They therefore failed to go for a fresh start, a clear break with the past and appoint a leader of manifest ability and the capacity to reach across the constitutional divisions in our country. These reasons, inter alia, underpinned my responses in that BBC interview about the future prospects for Scottish independence. A column written by Professor Tom Devine, a Scottish academic and author who specialises in the history of Scotland. He's also a Professor Emeritus at the University of Edinburgh. The National News on Wednesday the 3rd of May. Princess rejects calls to slim down the monarchy an article written by Steph Braun. Princess Anne has said slimming down the monarchy is not a good idea, as it provides long-term stability for the UK. King Charles's sister was interviewed by Canada's national broadcaster CBC about recent polling suggesting there are fewer people who would like to see the monarchy continue. The Princess Royal admitted the coronation was a moment for people to discuss the royal family's relevance but she insisted she was not engaged in such conversations, as the monarchy provides a degree of long-term stability that is actually quite hard to come by in any other way. Asked about the idea of a slimmed-down monarchy, the princess said it was originally proposed when there were a few more people around. It doesn't sound like a good idea from where I'm standing, I would say. I'm not quite sure what else we can do, she said. Reports have previously suggested that the king plans to reduce the number of working royals and the size of his staff in order to reduce the cost of the institution. Asked whether there were conversations about relevance given recent polling, Princess Royal added, There will be, 
everywhere, I think, it's perfectly true that it is a moment where you need to have that discussion. But I would just underline that the monarchy provides, with the constitution, a degree of long-term stability that is actually quite hard to come by in any other way. She also criticised the media, suggesting they do not pay enough attention to the work the royal family does in communities. She said, I think so often we get the chance to see communities and the people who do things really well and are very generous with their time, in a way that if you look at the media, you tend not to get that impression. The death of the Queen led to renewed debate in several countries in the Commonwealth about whether they want to become republics. A poll in September suggested that 54% of people in Canada thought the country should now end its ties with the British monarchy, while 46% disagreed. An article written by Steph Braun. From the National, Thursday the 4th of May 2023, from the news section, HMP IDWL inmates report abuse and bullying from staff. Report by Ross Hunter. A large portion of inmates at a Scottish prison told inspectors they had been abused, threatened, bullied or assaulted by members of staff. HM Inspectorate of Prisons for Scotland, HMIPS, visited HMP Addywell in West Lothian in November last year and released a report on its findings on Thursday, raising significant concerns about the enduring challenges impacting the safety and security of the facility. During the visit, inspectors found 40% of prisoners said they had been subjected to abuse, threatening behaviour, bullying or assault by staff with 60% claiming they had witnessed this behaviour towards other prisoners. Full inspection report said staff, on occasion, spoke to prisoners in an unprofessional way and found relationships between the workforce and inmates to be poor due to a lack of experienced staff and shortages. Only 29% of prisoners said they felt safe, with the report stating, HMIPS is deeply concerned that prolonged feelings of unsafety, lack of security, and fear could have a significant detrimental impact on prisoners' mental health, not to mention the potential risk to physical safety. We were not satisfied that HMP Adewell were taking sufficient action to address these concerns, and, in our judgement, there is a potential risk that violations of this right will arise. The inspectors also found prisoners were not receiving their full 60 minutes of fresh air they are entitled to. Poor levels of cleanliness was found in residential blocks at the prison, which opened in 2008. Access to healthcare at the prison was also rated as poor, with patient outcomes being compromised as a result of long waiting times. HMP Adewell is managed by Sodexo on behalf of the Scottish Prison Service, SPS. Inspectors have recommended both parties review the contract for the prison to ensure it does not inadvertently inhibit the safe and effective management of prisoners and drives improved purposeful activity participation levels. HMIPS also emphasised areas of good practice, including the range of learning opportunities offered to prisoners and the use of digital technology. Inspector said, In conclusion, HMP Adewell remains a frustrating conundrum. It is ahead of its SPS counterparts in embracing the potential of digital technology and shows commendable drive and commitment to embed new approaches such as the early day centre and the use of insider peer mentors, but it struggles to provide the basics of a safe, controlled environment. Until the enduring recruitment and retention issues are fully resolved and the prison can secure and retain sufficient experienced staff in all residential areas, there will continue to be an unacceptable risk to the safety of those in their care and a risk of continuing periods of instability. An HMP Adwell spokesperson said, Today's report outlines a number of areas that must be improved and we accept full responsibility for these. We have made significant financial investment into the prison, and, while some subsequent positive developments have been reflected in the report, this investment has not, as yet, translated into sustained results in some key areas, such as safety. Recruiting and retaining an increasingly experienced team of staff is critical to improving relationships and performance in these areas. This is our priority. Since the inspection, we have further increased levels of managerial support, altered the prison routine and started the rollout of a comprehensive improvement programme. These changes are starting to show early signs of making a positive impact 
but this must now be sustained. An SPS spokesperson said, This is a challenging report for Sodexo and the Scottish Prison Service. We accept it in its entirety, along with the recommendations within. It is, of course, completely unacceptable that anyone in custody in Scotland, including a privately run prison, should feel unsafe. It is reassuring to hear Sodexo take full responsibility for this, and we will robustly monitor its commitment to taking the actions necessary to deliver the improvements needed. We have a responsibility to all people in prison custody in Scotland and, as this report makes clear, standards at HMP Adewell have fallen short of the level people have a right to expect. Since the inspection took place, Sodexo's response has seen early indications of improvement and they are now taking an approach that recognises the need to support and provide additional resources at a senior leadership level with a more robust focus on performance and outcomes. We continue to rigorously monitor progress with additional SPS resources on site to work closely with Sodexo, as well as continued engagement at the highest level of Sodexo UK and SPS to ensure HMP Adewell is a safe and secure prison, delivering positive outcomes for those in custody there and supporting the wider justice sector and our communities. And that report was by Ross Hunter. From the National, Thursday the 4th of May 2023, from the news section, Murray Foote predicts the SNP will face no charges from police probe. Report by Ross Hunter. A former SNP communications chief has predicted that the SNP will face no charges at the conclusion of the police investigation into the party's finances. Murray Foote, who resigned as the SNP's head of communications and research at Holyrood following the row over the party's membership figures, said he was prepared to gamble on the police investigation failing to convict anyone within the party of wrongdoing. Writing in the Daily Record, where he previously served as editor, Foote described the police search of Nicholas Sturgeon and Peter Monroe's home as a grim spectacle and said the botched probe into the takeover of Rangers Football Club showed how high-profile investigations could fail to achieve any convictions. He said, I'm not saying branch form is a wild goose chase, but what if it is? Surely it's worth considering. Actually, if we cherish the presumption of innocence, then a no charges outcome must be at least considered. Given the grim spectacle at the house Peter Morell shares with Nicola Sturgeon and the, at the party HQ, it's inconceivable the authorities would be so cavalier without, without slam dunk evidence, right? Not necessarily. One more counters that assumption. Rangers. The legal cost of the wrongful pursuit of those involved in the administration and purchase of the Ibrox Club are upwards of £50 million. So, the authorities have previous for high-profile inquiries collapsing the scandal. He added that Morell and Colin Beattie, who have both been arrested and released without charge, were not master criminals and shared his opinion of the two men's characters. Peter's loyalty to his wife is unquestionable, he said. First Minister Sturgeon and her husband lived under crushingly intense scrutiny. It is inconceivable to me that Peter would so much as consider doing something dodgy, lest it rebound up and put his wife in jeopardy. Colin is no one's fool. He is a capable, cautious and diligent MSP who values his integrity. I am prepared to gamble the foot £5 and no charges at the end of all this. Should that bet be a winner, then the police and Crown Office will find themselves together in a very deep hole. Police diligently going about their business is one thing. What happened to FM's home is something else entirely. Since Foote's departure from the SNP, the party is committed to undertaking a governance and transparency review, with an interim report expected to be published in June. And that report was by Ross Hunter. From the National, Thursday the 4th of May 2023, from the news section, Primarch's stock vital coronation gear, DUP councillor complains. Report by Xander Eliards. A unionist councillor has written to clothing giant Primark telling it to stock coronation themed merchandise in his area. Despite the firm having a long standing policy against stocking politicised products in its Northern Irish stores, DUP councillor Paul Porter has complained about the lack of vital King Charles III stock to its chief, its chief executive. The representative for Lisburn South, which is southwest of Belfast, said, after receiving complaints from constituents that Primark is failing to provide the same products available in Great Britain 
in Northern Ireland to celebrate the coronation, I have contacted the chief executive and issued the following letter. Porter also put a tweet on April the 29th featuring a photograph of himself and the question, where are the coronation items in Northern Ireland stores? His letter reads, I am writing on behalf of my constituents who are seeking clarity as to when Primark stores in Northern Ireland will be stocking your coronation theme merchandise, which is currently available in GB based stores. As you will appreciate, the coronation has been eagerly anticipated by many people in Northern Ireland. As a constituent part of the United Kingdom, we will be playing a full part in the nationwide celebration of this historic event. To enable events such as street parties, lunches, barbecues and community fates, availability of merchandising, clothing and coronation memorabilia is vital. Primark enjoys great success in Northern Ireland and many within your loyal customer base are disappointed that merchandise available to GB customers is not currently available in Northern Ireland stores. I look forward to hearing from you and to hearing when Northern Ireland stores will be stocked with coronation items. A spokesperson for Primark said, we have never stocked any products featuring national emblems in our Northern Ireland stores. This is based on local market and customer considerations. The news comes after a Lord Ashcroft poll found that people in Northern Ireland would vote by 46% to 42% to remove the Royals as head of state. However, despite the pro-Republic polarity, a massive 81% of people in Northern Ireland said they thought their country would vote to remain a monarchy in any such referendum. And that report was by Xander Eliards. That concludes this week's edition of the National Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review and tell your friends about our service. <laughs>